Welcome everyone today uh, to the opening event of Robin Minard's Silent Music. I will introduce first my fellow pal pal panelists and thereafter Robin Minard will give some insight into silent music and his work. And then we have a conversation and there's also time for some QA. And then there's a wonderful reception that will await us outside. And so that you know who is talking to you, my name is Katharina Rosenberger and I'm a composer and also part of the faculty of the Department of Music. I have been a great admirer of Robin Minard's work for many, many years, but it was only 2013 uh, that we met. And the more it is now a great honor to have you here with us and um, to share your work and in particular silent music that is on view in the gallery just around the corner. And also we have work exhibited outside of the gallery, uh, Nacho Morte, uh, audiovisual work. And if you turn around the corner in the hallway, there's on four monitors, uh, very beautiful audiovisual documentations of four of his projects. So we invite you to venture around and explore everything. Robbie Minar is professor of electroacoustic music at the University of Franz Liszt and the Bauhaus University in Weimar, Germany. He's also the director of the SEAM, that is the studio for electroacoustic music, uh, specialized in acousmatic music, an institute that grew under um, his guidance and actually he established that in 1997, so 20 years ago. Uh, born in Montreal, um, Robin likes to travel around the world. His works have been shown around the world as remotely as the very northeastern tip of Canada, um, where he worked with the Inuits uh, for three weeks. Um, it was a project that explored the overtone singing, but also he was very much interested in the landscape. And um, he worked for three weeks at times in temp temperature at minus 58 Fahrenheit. I learned, imagine that. So this project is also on uh, display on the four monitors. Um, and very soon, uh, some work will bring you to the Amazon at the border of Venezuela and Brazil. Uh, next to his artistic work, numerous prestigious artistic residences have brought him, uh, for instance, to Germany, that was the DAHD in Berlin, Australia, Italy, France, Holland, Canada, and residen residents in USA and Taiwan. Um, but to conclude this short introduction, Robbie Minard's oeuvre is known for his keen interest in the exploration, how we perceive and listen to various acoustic phenomena, and in the shar sharpening of our relationship to nature and in general, our environments through sound, through listening. But more you will hear then by him. And to go further, I would like to thank very much our panelists to share this evening with us. And I would like to welcome Diana Deutsch. She as well, uh, I have known her work for quite a while before we met. And um, there, there is this Diana Deutsch bus uh, in the music department. So our students have been really happily following your classes and starting with you. So finally, I know you and now we sit together on this panel. Uh, she's internationally known for her musical illusions and paradoxes that she discovered. These include, just to name a few, the octave illusion, the scale illusion, glissando illusion, also phantom words illusion. Diana Deutsch also explores memory for music and how we relate the sounds of music and speech to each other. In addition, she studies absolute pitch, why some people possess it and also why it is so rare. She has been elected <coughs> a fellow um, of the American Association for the Advanced of Science and Acoustical Society of America the Audio Engineering Society, and from whom, just last year, she has been awarded the Gold Medal Award for lifelong contributions to the understanding of the human hearing mechanism and the science of psychoacoustics. Then elected fellow of the Society of Experimental Psychologists, the American Psychological Society, and the American Psychological Association. She received the Rudolf Arnheim Award for Outstanding Achievement in Psychology and the Arts from the American Psychological Association, the Gustav Theodor Fenscher Award for Outstanding Contributions to Empirical Aesthetics from the International Association of Empirical Aesthetics, and the Science Writing Award for Professionals in Acoustics from the Acoustical Society of America. 
She has written um, over 200 publications, including The Psychology of Music, where she's the editor for the first, second, and also third edition. So I'm very happy that you're here with us tonight. On the other end of the table, I would like to welcome Jeffrey Sandubre. Jeffrey Sandubre holds an appointment at UCSD as Engineering Program Manager at the Qualcomm Institute. He is also the director for the Sonic Arts Research and Development Group and also a jazz drummer. Prior to his return to UCSD, um, as you told me today, you, you did your studies here, so it's nice to have people come back to UCSD. Uh, Jeffrey Sonnebray has built an extraordinary career performing applied research, engineering of products and systems, and managing projects of national significance. Among his expertise are engineering analysis and design of solar energy systems, and expertise in mechanical and structural sound and vibration on projects to analyze and measure radiated acoustic noise in underwater environments to assess vulnerability and to develop quieting measures. Or in short, expertise in the application of complex emerging technologies, engineering analysis and design, systems, architecture and integration and software development. He was principal investigator on programs for Los Alamos National Laboratories, laboratories NASA, Department of Defense, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and the Department of Justice, to name a few, and has worked almost two decades in leading positions at the SAIC, S -I -I -C, that is the Science Applications International Corporation. Um, so it's a pleasure to have you on board. And as announced, Peter Otto, unfortunately, he's not able to be here with us tonight. But if we are lucky, uh, we are going to be joined at some point by composer, sound and software designer and producer Sharok Yadegari, who is on the faculty of the Department of Music. And most likely all of you know him uh, through his role as the director of the Initiative for Digital Exploration of the Arts and Sciences, the IDEAS Initiative. Um, that takes place here at the Qualcomm Institute and uh, California Institute for Technolo Telecommunication Information Technology. So um, that this exhibition is happening and our gathering here tonight, I would like to thank very, very much the Qualcomm Institute, California Institute for Telecommunication Information Technology, our Tristone for the superb organization of it all, and for the great technical support of the AV team, particular Hector Brajo and Joel Polizzi, and all the many helpers who stopped by this week uh, to help us build the installations. Um, if you want, you can count the speakers that are in the installation, and then you get a sense of what I mean. There's a prize. <laughs> There's a prize, OK. <laughs> <laughs> so and now I'm happy to pass the word along to Robbie Minar. And um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks very much, and uh, thanks to the Institute for inviting me. Thanks, Katrina, for the idea of having me invited. Um, thanks, Trish, as well, for organizing the show at the gallery. Um, I'm very honored to be surrounded by such people here, and I hope we'll have an interesting discussion at the end. I wanted to do my experiment, which I was going to do at the end. I'll do it first. Um, not yet, Hector, but um, I was trying to think of a good way to describe what my work deals with, because I'm working a lot in public spaces. I studied um, composition uh, in the 70s and early 80s and became very concerned about the kind of sound environments we lived in. It didn't seem adequate to me to be going to concert halls once or twice a week and listening to music and the rest of the time uh, for very specific reasons like Muzak, which I'll describe, um, to be uh, walking around in spaces where we're unconscious of the, the sounds we're listening to. And it seemed to me that composers could play a, a role in this, in sound environments in everyday life as well. So if I just ask everybody to listen to this space that you've been listening to since you got here, and ask Hector to turn it off. That's what my work is about. This space is, was quiet when we arrived, but it wasn't quiet at all. There was this. You want to turn it back on, Hector? The sound was going on the whole time. Nobody noticed it. The space seemed quiet. But all these spaces we live in are colored by various, especially today, by various kinds of ventilators. And turn it off again, Hector. <laughs> it will be. 
a bit quieter. Um, but if you listen again, there's a lot of other things going on in this space too. There's a ventilator. There's some humming from the computers. And these are all kinds of sounds that surround us all the time that we're unconscious of. One thing that's important in my work is this kind of um, the ways we have of listening. We have uh, intellectual ways of listening to music, uh, interpreting musical language and listening to the way composers work with themes and narrative kind of uh, intellectual listening where we interpret a language. Uh, we could listen to that same music when we're jogging and listen to it in a completely different way. We have an uh, ecological listening where we listen to sounds of nature and the surroundings where there's things like sound signals and ambient sounds and uh, sounds that t send us messages about the environments we're in. We have an architectural type of listening where we listen to spaces and our ears play as much a role or more of a role in listening to spaces than our eyes in perceiving spaces than our eyes do. When you enter a huge cathedral, it's not necessarily this, the volume of the space you see, but the volume of the space you hear. And your ears are telling you a lot about the volume of the space, the, the, the building materials, what kind of frequencies are being reflected, about the structure of the space, how, th how reflections are happening. So this whole feeling of space uh, and our surroundings uh, the ears play uh, quite an important role. So that became an interesting uh, basis idea for me to start working as a composer uh, trying to make sound spaces. So one of the pieces that I uh, installed outside the gallery is uh, called Music for Quiet Spaces and its compositional objective was just to color space in a very unconscious way. One thing I didn't, yes we have in, inside all these kinds of listenings, we have conscious listening, which we do use in music and environments, and unconscious listening, which is the kind of listening we have when we're in this space here, and there's all these, uh, this ambient sound happening, which we, which we aren't consciously aware of. Uh, I studied composition in Montreal in from around mid-70s to the early 80s, and it's very cold in the wintertime in Montreal. It goes down to about minus 40 sometimes. So cities have various solutions for this. In Mini I was in Minneapolis. They have uh, uh, it's very windy and cold there, and they have bridges that go through the city where you can go between buildings without having to go outdoors. And Montreal has an underground city where you can navigate in within the city without going out into the cold, which is a nice idea. But they had um, uh, music playing in the in this whole system, which means there's a loudspeaker every uh, uh, three or four meters. Uh, playing music, which to me as a composer was uh, unacceptable. I think it was because I was working in the studio late at night and it was the music that was trying to keep me, uh, to, to put me to sleep and I was just trying to wake up and I'd leave at five in the morning when the subway opened up and it would be the music that's trying to pep people up to get to work and I was trying to go to sleep and so then you really notice it. But uh, uh, my first reaction to it was that I wanted to cut the speaker wires and stop the system but eventually I, I thought as a composer, if, if it's not something I'm concerned about because I'm working with sound myself, that uh, 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 if composers aren't, weren't concerned with it, then who else should be? And that's when I started uh, as a young composer to, to develop uh, musical concepts that didn't deal with the concert hall, but that dealt with public spaces. So the question became, um, my first questions were if I'd play it, traditional or conventional type of music in public space, is it uh, appropriate for that kind of space? And intuitively I said, no, it's not because you're, you're not dealing with the same kind of musical listening. You're not listening anymore to the way the themes are, are worked out by a composer and things. It just becomes like a musical blanket, which is trying to influence your behavior. So I, I asked myself, what kind of works would work in a public space? And uh, the first piece that I, that I really composed uh, in this uh, way was the piece that is played in the concert, in the outside the gallery, which is called Music for Quiet Spaces. It's from 1984, which is kind of the beginning of when I started uh, working in this way with sound. So that was, what, uh, 33 years ago. And I just decided for this talk to trace a few lines in these last 33 years uh, through my work 
uh, to give a put the 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 the, uh, the um, exhibition in context and give you an idea of about where it came from. Um, uh, this music for quiet spaces. When I began to compose it, I was looking for ways of composing music that didn't have to do with narrative content, which I mentioned this intellectual listening, and I began to uh, structure works on on acoustics. Uh, I'll just say it quite simply uh, that I began to look at beats that happen between frequencies. So the the uh, structure of the music is based on the beat patterns that happen between the f intervals of the notes that are that you're hearing in the space. So there's this micro level where there's very small beats happening between the frequencies, and because they're equal tempered, there's a couple of levels of beats happening, audible beats and difference tones and things. And I transpose this world uh, onto a larger scale. I think there's about uh, one second that's transposed over 20 minutes. So these beats for me became just temporal envelopes where I could control um, um, changing register to move from very low sounds to very high sounds or uh, dynamics in the piece. So what you're really hearing in this piece is is kind of an enlargement of these beat forms uh, that uh, are present in the acoustics as a quick explanation. Uh, I'm going to just get out of here so I can skip through the piece. So the idea of the piece, it's for um, vibraphone and tape delay, which was recorded and it becomes a, a tape piece. Uh, to start at the lowest sounds on the vibraphone and to move almost inconspicuously to the highest sounds and then back into the lowest sounds. And that happens about over about 20 minutes, which of course compositionally is a bit hard to control. That's why I needed these beat patterns to, to be able to organize it. So it, this is kind of the region it starts in. And of course, it's a music I can talk while you're listening to, because you don't have to follow any kind of narration. And it's just designed to color the space, which is what it's doing in the... So it's much like the ventilators that are <coughs> present in the space, but it has its own color and its own form. And very slowly, after five minutes, it ends up One analogy which I thought of when I was began to working in this way is you know, when, when you paint a space and you paint the ceiling dark, it seems to make the space lower somehow. If you know if you had a small room, you would never paint the walls dark because it would kind of close in on you. What happens when you play a low resonant sound in a space or a high clear sound like this and you have this kind of unconscious listening in the space, what kind of a spatial impression do you get? So the early pieces I was doing in the 80s were moving from this very low resonant sounds to very high clear sounds over three quarters of an hour so so that it would be a, not a not a perceived change in the space but a very slow and if you walked out and came back in it would be a different acoustic space but if you stayed in it it would be changing very slowly the only uh, analogy to this in architecture i think is daylight you know uh, uh, architecture is a very static object but what really changes in architecture is daylight so it changes our impression of the space it changes the, our relationship to to uh, volume and things uh, and it turns architecture into something very fluid so my premise is of course that once we understand how sound influences the way we perceive space we can use sound to make space a very kind of fluid flexible material
So that's the basis of this piece, which you can listen to outside the gallery. It'll be on until the 9th of June. <laughs> so, uh, and um, so in 10 years later, after this one, Oh no, this is a, another piece I did uh, two years later after this uh, piece which you just heard, which is a, a series of 32 pipes which just distributed the musical register in space. So you would walk from low sounds into high sounds. I call it music for passageways and it creates a sound passageway which you walk through. So it's installed in various uh, kinds of spaces. This is a small square kind of space. Sometimes it's more elongated. Here's another picture of it. <clears throat> so this came slightly, slightly later, um, uh, wanting to stretch the sounds in the space out. So I was at at in my studio taking apart conventional loudspeaker boxes and taking the the low frequency speakers out and the tweeters and putting the tweeters in the kitchen and the low frequencies in the living room and kind of walking through the space. So. Um, this work resulted out of uh, experiments with, with uh, spatial effect of sound and led me into a kind of uh, working with, with sculpture. I didn't study visual arts, but slowly it, these, um, um, the use of resonators and reflectors and things led me into uh, the visual arts. Uh, about 10 years later, I had a commission from a horticultural exhibition in Germany. Um, and was a strange situation because the the only criteria they had because they had federal funding they were kind of obliged to do projects with artists they said their criteria was that um, uh, it should be inc inconspicuous um, so I ended up making um, for the horticultural exhibition uh, small greenhouse structures well they're about this high greenhouse structures with uh, integrated waterproof loudspeakers and uh, letting grass grow inside with the loudspeakers um, which uh, awoke an interest in me in this um, um, our perception of nature and technology uh, what we perceive as being natural and what we perceive, perceive as being artificial which of course in the horticultural exhibition my loudspeakers seemed as much uh, as, as organic as some of the hybrid flowers they had there um, the sound material for this piece uh, was inspired by the environment in which I installed it. So I did a kind of a study of the, the environment. There was a road uh, near the space where it was installed. So there were cars going by, making some and there was some construction around, so tapping and some insects. So I used all these kind of variations of these sounds as uh, part of the installation. I can play some of them here. There were five of these objects reacting to movement of the environment. So the objectives of these sounds was not to to uh, present a musical composition, but to blend into the sounds of the environment um, uh, with the objective that when, when the people left the installation area, suddenly they didn't know where the border was between what they were hearing as part of the installation and what we, they were hearing as part of the environment. So hopefully it stimulated their consciousness of the environment, because of course when it's coming from the object you begin to listen but then you don't know if you're listening to the object or the environment. And when you leave, you've begun listening to the environment, in fact. So it was not really a question of pointing to myself or to the artwork as the focus of attention, but more uh, to the environment. And this um, fascination with uh, what happened in this piece, because it was meant to be inconspicuous, uh, became very interesting to me. Uh, and I began to create a lot of uh, organic-like installations. So this was the inspiration for the work Silent Music, which I began in 1994. 
Um, this was the, this is a picture of the first installation in Vienna, which I did in 1994, which was about with 50 loudspeakers. And now in the installation here, there's about 450 or 480 loudspeakers. So it's um, something I've been doing over the last uh, 20 some years. It keeps changing now and then and uh, taking on different forms. I'll just show a few pictures of it. This was um, about a year and a half ago in Korea. And what you see behind this installation, these lines, that's a, a much newer piece. Uh, it's a, a film of a, uh, a glacial stream in Switzerland, which is filmed from above. So uh, it's about a six meter high projection of this, this uh, river flowing up the wall. And there's just very low frequency subwoofer playing this rumbling, uh, recording of the of the glacial stream, which is um, very interesting when it's combined with these small high frequency loudspeakers. So this was like a combination installation. And this is an installation of the work in a, in 1995 in a library. I often get a response in public spaces that uh, no, we don't want sound; we want quiet. You know? And um, part of my work deals with the fact that. Sometimes sounds can create a more quiet environment than uh, than a quiet environment where there's perturbing sounds. I think we all know that when we sit by sit by a, a, a river, uh, a stream, and it's totally quiet, but the sound environment is very complex. This this is what kind of inspires my work as well. Natural environments where the environment can be very complex and interesting, but you don't have to listen to it. You can be walking through with somebody and talking and not concentrating on it. And you don't have to listen, but you can at the same time, you can sit down for hours and listen to to this environment in detail. And that's what inspires my work. And it did work in the library. We, there was uh, two very similar spaces in this library. I installed in one of the spaces and most of the people worked in the space with the sound. It was seemed much quieter than without. And it was a question of really finding this uh, borderline where it becomes a kind of unconscious sound. It's there when you kind of come out of your reading and it kind of comforts you and envelops you, but it doesn't bother you. And that's the kind of, um, I was working with Hector here to find this um, uh, borderline where you don't notice this sound when you come in, uh, uh, you missed this one. <laughs> I had a, an ambient sound playing, which uh, we turned off when I started my lecture. Um, uh, this borderline where you don't consciously notice the sound. This is a permanent installation in Tenerife, in the Canary Islands. And you can listen to the installation uh, in the gallery space, but this is approximately what it sounds like. Of course, you might want to notice that it's very different to listen to it on stereo speakers and to listen to it on several hundred speakers. So it's made up of natural-like sounds. They're all synthetic sounds. Uh, with the objective that um, if you listen to it very closely, you notice there are loops in it, and uh, especially in this water sound, there's little loops happening, so you realize it's not real natural sound, which is much like the loudspeakers and the cables, which are only plastic loudspeakers and cables, but somehow t your brain is telling you there's something natural about it, and you keep kind of flipping back between these two perceptions, which is the sort of thing I want to do with the sound as well. And this inspired several works uh, which uh, deal with uh, organic-like forms. Oh no, this is what I want. Uh, also these small small loudspeakers. Uh, I did an installation with 576 of these, which was done with uh, IRCAM in Paris. They did the technical part. Um, 
it uses one bit sound. So each of these loudspeakers, each of these uh, 576 loudspeakers gets one bit of sound. So it can only turn off and on. It clicks. Of course, if you click randomly, you get noise. Like uh, If you click periodically, you get a frequency. Uh, so you can do very simple things with this. You can also, there was a lot of gating of the noise. So you go, you do this kind of thing. But uh, it was using, it was decomplexing a um, digital audio signal, 24 bits, eight channels with three ADAT outputs. So you get 576 bits out of that. So we could control each one, the, the signals to each of these loudspeakers. And uh, it turned into a physical uh, matrix, whoops, physical matrix, which on which sounds could move. So like doing waves, whoops, waves, that's what, what it sounds like, doing waves or uh, circles like and lines and things on this physical surface. It's a bit like um, lights. So if you have a light chain and you see a line moving, uh, it's exactly the same kind of, you perceive uh, a uh, continuous line. And there's no phantom signal, of course, you could stand right beside it and you still hear the circle. It had 18 kilometers of cable. And this kind of work with the plant-like things inspired a lot of uh, um, organic-like installations. This is uh, with 2,000 of these small speakers. This is a shadow with loudspeakers. This shadow is made out of loudspeakers. So actually when you walk into the space, you think nothing is there. Then you start to notice that the shadow is making sound and that it's not really a shadow. Also, small piezos integrated in paper, which are very kind of intimate objects now. Small some small travel diaries which I did, which have uh, you can plug into your stereo system, read the text, and these works and many others are also described in the videos that are installed in the hallway. So it's just to give you an idea of what my work is about. This is a, a piece that happened in 2010 in Germany. The federal government government financed a the federal government financed a program to bring new music to the, to Germany. Um, and the 15 cities participated in this project and the organization wanted to have a train that drove from city to city during the summer. So I got, they hired me to be responsible and to choose this train and to, to do it. The project for me became about listening, um, ways, ways that we listening or these listening modes. We picked 15 different listening points in each city. So there were 225 listening points in Germany. You could go, you could get a map and go to, in each city, go to the listening points and listen to them on site. You could listen to them on internet with a, on a map, or you could listen to them in the installation as part of an artwork. So the project was really about listening, the ways we listen, the modes we listen in, and uh, how these how the, the meaning of sounds change depending on the context that they're in. This was the, the train that had the sound installation in it. And there's a, this film uh, is played in the, in the hallway, so I'll skip that. Oh, okay. And there's also a series of blue installations. This is at the uh, mattress factory in Pittsburgh. Yeah. In Chemnitz in Germany. And this is ho this was a this is the I think my last slide. This is a hotel room in France, where uh, one one or maximum of two people were allowed to to go in during the festival, and spend ten minutes. And there's um, uh, blue filters on the on the uh, windows, so the space is also the blueness changes depending on the exterior light, and there's a. Uh, also very just it, it was the extension of this idea of coloring space with sound also coloring it with this blue light so the whole room was made white with white accessories and white things and it all just turned blue it kind of erases the uh, the um, 
uh, perspective in the room. Um, which is one point I, I mentioned as a talking point. Uh, installation is kind of an experiment in perception. Uh, a curator in Mexico where I did a piece, she had a very interesting text about how these installations really sharpen our uh, awareness uh, because there are slight incongruencies in them that make you, with these, this plant installation for example, that um, it seems to be like plant-like but your brain knows it isn't. So your brain becomes very active because it's trying to place what it really is. And these kind of very subtle changes in the norm uh, make you very aware. And I think of this one thing that I want to do with my installations, they're always very quiet, uh, is just to make people begin to listen. One thing that's very tragic in life today is that we're learning more and more not to listen, walking around with headphones or uh, just not listening. And I hope that the installations, they're very intimate and they make you bend down and listen to things. And I hope if there's one thing that they do is to help people listen again. Did I take two? <laughs> Not yet, but actually we, we are lucky and Sharok Yadigari did join in and um, yeah, if, if you would you like to join us on stage? <laughs> so I want to stay a little bit with the theme of specialized, specialized music and what does it do to, to the listening behavior. And one thing is clear, specialization helps you to distinct sounds. Oops, I moved into the wrong direction. <laughs> and, um, and that's also uh, in silent music, um, Robin was very careful um, to distinct the sounds. So he has fear so four zones um, that you walk towards to and you, you get a sense of in, in which way the sounds uh, are different from each other. And um, so it seems to me, my first question actually goes right away uh, to Robin, that um, speciali uh, specialization and the possibility to zoom into a sound by walking towards it, to zoom with my ear into a texture, um, runs through your work. Is it um, en environmental sounds or electroacoustic sounds? So you have an affinity for specialization. And I was wondering what other elements attract you to work with specialization? Well, that's one thing I, I didn't mention because I do also acousmatic music, which is music for loud, for high fidelity loudspeakers, which is a really different kind of approach because of course we're trying to trick the ear into thinking there's a space there. So we make sounds close or we make them far away. I mean, projecting sounds over um, loudspeakers is not just working with two sound sources, it's working with this whole space in between. And with the fact which you mentioned yesterday that we perceive high sounds as being higher in space and low sounds as being lower. And there's the whole thing about the median plane, sounds we, we perceive as coming from above us or from behind us. Uh, you can work with boosted bands in electroacoustics to kind of turn this whole space between the loudspeakers into really a three-dimensional space. Um, which has height and depth and uh, distance and so that's a really interesting thing in studio making the ears believe they're hearing a space and I like to work with that in my work in installations it's a totally different thing if I want a sound to be far away I put a speaker there and it doesn't have to be a hi-fi speaker that's why in sound installation art as well we have we use artists you tend to use don't not always but tend to use low fidelity speakers because they're an instrument in themselves. So um, the best example is if you have a, a, a crickets, they make a very small band of signal. It's not very, comp you know, in terms of acoustics, it's not very complex. You can make it electronically very simply. It's a very simple sound. But if you have a field of a thousand of these little crickets peeping, that's the kind of a sound space you cannot reproduce with, uh, with uh, any kind of multi-channel sound system. So there's this difference between 
creating the impression of a space and working with space, mm. which is really incredibly interesting to me. And I tend to use, in installations, to use very lo-fi uh, technology to create very high fidelity space. Mm. Um, there comes to my mind um, something that I talked to Jeffrey about and in a, in a studio space that were we to have possibly three of the speakers and you know the sound um, it would be very intimate and very kind of small sounding but now we have 200 speakers in, in so it, Here, in, yeah so it enriches the space and you feel like you physically in the space and it becomes very visceral and tangible actually the sound um, and Jeffrey told me about the work he did actually with a sound that could be a little bit similar with rain and that happened actually in our spat lab so I was wondering maybe you can just explain quickly what the spat lab does but then also what what actually did you do and what did you experience with this rain experiment sure in our in our lab some of you have probably experienced it but we we took a very simple recording of rain, a monophonic recording of rain, and we play it through one speaker and it doesn't do much. And then we spread it around into our 24 channel speaker and provide a little decorrelation and it feels like you're inside of a rainstorm. And it actually feels colder. Everyone, almost everyone who experiences it, say they actually feel a visceral response from, from that change. It's mm -hmm. extraordinary. And I experience the same thing in the uh, listening to Robin's piece. So you, you said like you decorrelate them, but also did you add some different rewords, reverb to it to make really the, the rain deep, you know? Nothing. Or no, nothing. simply decorrelation. We created uh -huh. a delay, spread it around the room, and all of a sudden you're in the rainforest feeling cold. Very interesting. Um, I, I mentioned that actually spatialization can help you to distinct sounds, but um, the completely different, there, there, there are phenomena that something completely the opposite can happen, and actually Diana surprised me with um, an effect that I was really stunned. And um, so it, it depends also the quality of sounds um, that um, let themselves spatialize. There are sounds they don't let themselves spatialize, and I'm referring to the sweep, the frequency. Free, uh, sweep that you showed me. So I, I was wondering maybe to explain it shortly what that experiment was about and maybe do you have an estimate what happens? How come that we cannot localize the sweep? Yeah, well this is actually a stereo illusion where you have, you really have to listen to it to, you know, uh, um, appreciate it. but. At all events, you have this oboe tone that goes back and forth between loudspeakers, which are to your left and to your right. And then you have this sine wave that goes up and down in pitch. And when a component of the oboe tone um, is on the left, the sine, a component of the sine wave is on the right. When a component of the oboe tone is on the right, the sine wave is on the left. OK. And um, when this is played in stereo, you clearly hear the oboe tone going back and forth between the speakers, as you might expect. But the sine wave appears joined together quite seamlessly, though in fact when you listen to only one channel at a time, you find that that's not what's happening at all. And it seems to be moving around in space in accordance with its pitch motion. And what you hear varies depending upon whether you're right-handed or left-handed, statistically that is. Um, so most right-handers hear um, the sine wave as low down um, and to their left when it's at its lowest. And as it moves up, it, it, it forms an ellipse, and when it's at its highest, it's at the top and to the right, and then it goes back down again. As it goes down in pitch, it seems to move back in space. But you really do have to hear it because um, just describing it makes, you know, you know, it's, you know, you, you don't get the, the effect, obviously. But it does work very well anyway. And it's moving back and forth. Yeah, I yeah, can. point of fact, it's just moving back and forth, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe I can help out a little bit. I mean, um, if, if anybody, if anybody yes. had, a, you know, like a Mac, and, you know, we could, 
you know, just plug it into stereo loudspeakers. Possibly we could the, actually do it yeah. once I mean, the, the talk, maybe, you know, once, because we, time is really running, but I think mm. we could do it while the, while the reception is happening. But, I mean, you hear in between the oboe sounds, you hear the spatialization very, very well. You have two stereo yeah, speakers and you cut the yeah, tone and it goes, do, 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 left, right. But in one channel, do you, you hear the oboe do, and then the sweep do, we do, we do, we do, we do, we. So that's that's kind of what you hear in one speaker. But when you hear both together, both channels, you can really distinct the left right of the oboe, and the sweep is just continuous, and you can't really localize it. It's somewhere in the middle, but it follows really the trace of the low tone. You you sense it on the lower end of your left, and then it rises, and you hear it higher up. So that's um I'd, I'd be curious to to hopefully one day understand what's really going on it's it's really phenomenal yeah well i mean partly what's happening is that the auditory system rejects the idea of of having one speaker producing this disjunct pattern that is a patch of an oboe tone alternating with a patch of a sine wave and so on because that doesn't really happen in real life and the other speaker hit producing the same thing only in alternation and instead the perceptual system links the sine wave to, joins the sine wave uh, together the pieces of the sine wave together so that it sounds continuous even though in point of fact it really isn't continuous so it's really a case of what psychologists call top-down processing and you're, you're just the perceptual system is producing what is the most likely interpretation of mm. this, you know, very bizarre sound that you would never really hear in real life. Mm. Wow. Great. Right. Thank mm. you for that explanation. Mm. And um, Sharok, so also in your work, um, you work with specialization, but, you know, as, as a composer, but also in, in software design. So I was just wondering if there are other elements in specialization that we haven't mentioned that enriches your artistic work or, you know, that matters to you in your work. First, thank you for inviting me oh, no, to be here, to have coming. the pleasure and honor to be here with you. Uh, and I'm sorry if I walked in late and um, I want to ask a question from uh, Robin, because I think you bring up a really interesting mm -hmm. point that spatialization changes the nature of the music that we listen to. Mm -hmm. Like uh, when you have in harmonic sounds that are on one speaker, if you spatialize them, if you move them, they don't sound as in harmonic. And, and I wonder if you're, how you compose your pieces, because I imagine when you build your pieces, the final installation becomes the real experience of the mm. piece. So it's hard to actually think about how it is going to sound while what you just mentioned at the end that you said it's what is the main part of your work is that interaction between the synthetic sound and the live sound and in the end you produce such sensual and like really carnal sound that the sounds that we hear we feel very attached to so I'm curious about your creative process of how you uh, conceive pieces like this, especially with like one bit speaker, yeah. that it has, a, needless to say, a very synthetic sound. Yeah. So how do you really think about it and then how you use the spatialization into in achieving that kind of sensual sound? Yeah, quite simply, it's always different. You know? the, the, the one bit sound was set up for two months and I just worked with, with this system. So I don't think you can imagine what that kind of system would do. A lot of pieces I try to set up in my studio on kind of a small scale to see what happens right. with a lot of things that are happening spatially. And uh, I mean, uh, some of it is also experience. And a lot of it is going into the space and understanding the space itself first. Right. Um, especially when pieces are for specific kinds of spaces, I spend a lot of time getting to know the space acoustically and walking in and out and how the space unfolds and what happens when you go in the space. And when I once I install something in the space too, I spend a lot of time walking in and out and seeing, you know, I spend as much time walking in and out of this gallery space as I did inside it on the weekend when I was setting it up. 
just to see how it mm. unfolds when you walk in and how the sounds kind of uh, the visual and the sounds uh, unfold for you you know so there's kind of an entrance and a unfolding of the installation basically I think it's always uh, different but it's always a discovery experience it's a Absolutely. this idea of space sound and space is so rich and so incredible yeah and it has like Diana mentioned it has its own rules you know I teach composition as well and you know when we're working with sound space uh, you know and you just working with students then intuitively that doesn't work why doesn't it work because your ear doesn't understand it you know there's not the right kind of weight when a sound moves sounds have ways of moving in space and when that doesn't trigger with the nature of sound and it doesn't work musically musically what we are talking about like musically as a uh, in comp composing with sound and not tones this this uh, relationship of sound and space is something that is really inside us as well I think you in our perception. make an excellent point that when spatializations come into play in music it's not only sound it affects it actually affects the music yeah. of what yeah. we're hearing and thus you know I really think of this that when you have spatialized elements in a piece you bring an element that starts resonating the space you're playing the space yeah. mm -hmm. rather than yeah. playing the pace the piece into the space yes yeah. yeah space becomes an instrument mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very happy yeah to that that you mentioned this because um you know sound is never an isolated element it always lives in relation to where it's played and and how it's placed and also how how the listener can navigate and experience um, the sound so and um, we we are approaching almost um, <laughs> six o'clock but I, I do want to talk about one other element and I want to have some we questions as well time. we were yeah um, you, you you ended on a very beautiful note and you know we noticed if you go in the gallery that the level of the sound is, is fairly low and also your examples the sound the, the the amplitude the level is very low and um i really like that engagement to encourage the people to to begin listening again to to search the sound and and open the ears and then do that in a everyday environment not just in the gallery and um diana worked also quite a bit with this element of actually the situations where you involuntarily are um, exposed to sound and uh, that actually you don't want to listen and you you have to shut down um, how robin ended his presentation is 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 there some hope in it also on a, a scientific level um, that you know is there a way that we we can endure all the music or you you mentioned it like wallpaper music um, you know uh, is there a counter movement we, we artists could raise to enlighten and make listening more acute again? Well, it's it's an interesting point that this is really a contemporary phenomenon. I mean, <clears throat> if you consider a hundred years ago, they didn't have you know recorded sound, so they didn't have loudspeakers. Um, you know, producing sounds in restaurants, department stores, supermarkets, hotel lobbies, elevators, airports, railway stations, libraries, doctors waiting rooms, um, even hospitals where, you, where people are sick and want to be left alone. So um, it's, I, I mean, I personally am, am one of a growing number of people who find this quite objectionable because it, it really can be very upsetting to, to, um, to a lot of people. So <clears throat> there's an organization that I haven't actually joined but really should called Pipe Down, and it reports thousands of paying mem and there are thousands of paying members who distribute pre-printed pre post-protest cards sorry, in their campaign to restore freedom from unwanted music. And there's a 1994 survey conducted by the management of London's Gatwick Airport, and 43% of its 68,000 respondents said that they disliked pipe music. 
Um, and actually, in consequence of that, they discontinued pipe music in the main areas of Gatwick. And supermarket chains in England, such as Sainsbury, were persuaded not to install background music. Interestingly, in 1997, the London Times conducted a poll asking readers what, in that quote, was the single thing they most detested about modern life. And pipe music came third on the list behind two other forms of noise. And let's see, in 2005, a BBC poll of train travellers in Essex found that 67% of the responders objected to pipe television being introduced into the trains. And some people even barricaded themselves in the toilets to avoid the unwanted sound. <laughs> and as a result, pipe television was dropped from the service and the management even created what they called quiet zones, zones which people were asked not to use their cell phones or other noisy electronic devices. Um, I mean, another reason why I think pipe music of this sort is, is bad is because people who are hearing impaired um, and who are trying to understand speech um, are then at a disadvantage. And even blind people find background music disoriented since they rely on sound cues to help navigate, so for example, to cross the road and so on. So a um, quote, for example, Daniel Barenboim, who delivered an angry attack on this violation of his personal space. And in her Reef Lecture in Chicago, he wrote, he declared, I have been more than one occasion subject to having to hear, because I cannot shut my ears, the Brahms Violin Concerto in the lift, having to conduct it in the evening. And I asked myself why? This is not going to bring one more person into the concert hall, and it's not only counterproductive, but I think if we are allowed to use an old term to speak of musical ethics, it is absolutely offensive. Now, a further protest about the ubiquity of music in our society occurred in 1995 with the establishment of a day called No Music Day. And this was the brainchild of former rock star Bill Drummond, who was a co-founder of a highly successful band, the KLF, that abruptly stopped performing at the height of their success. And he picked November the 21st to observe this day, since November the 22nd is the Feast of St. Cecilia, patron saint of music. And Drummond publicly announced that on this day, and this is a quote, no records will be played on the radio, iPods will be left at home, rock bands will not rock, jingles will not jangle, milkmen will not whistle, among other prohibitions. And in consequence, thousands of people in the UK pledged themselves not to play or listen to music on No Music Day. And BBC Radio Scotland even declared in 1997 that they would observe it and not play music on that day. So, um, so here is um, another quote from Barenboim. Um, which um, which is worth which is worth quoting. Um, He says, the most extraordinary example of offensive use of music, because it underlines some kind of association which I failed to recognize, was shown to me one day when watching the television in Chicago and seeing a commercial of a company called American Standard. And it showed a plumber running very fast in great agitation, opening the door to a toilet and showing why this company actually cleans the toilet better than other companies. And you know what music was played to that? The Lacrimosa from Mozart's Requiem. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, but I'm probably immodest enough to think that I have a sense of humor, but I can't laugh at this. So I do think that there, I mean, I do agree with um, these, these various people who feel very strongly that pipe music and and other such things should should in fact be abolished um, or at least you know reduced considerably because because of these problems. I personally find find such music very offensive. 
And the problem is that I can't not listen to it. When I hear music, my attention mechanism swoops down onto it and it drives out other thoughts. I can't, I can't speak properly, I can't listen to speech and so on. And so um, I guess that's, that's it. That's, that's why it doesn't work. That's why it didn't work with me in the, the in, well. That's why it didn't work with me in the early '80s in Montreal because I was listening to it. And when you listen to it, it's not behavior control anymore. It's yeah. musical listening, which doesn't work in that kind of space and situation. Yeah. So that's why it, that's why music doesn't work at all. But I well, think some people like it actually. So well, I mean, I when I when I first you know describe this to, to people. A few people say, yeah, yeah, but they like it. There, there's some software called Shazam, is that right? Where you can, you can um, have it determine what a piece is that's being played so that you can find its name and then listen to it later. And they say that they use it for that reason. So they're, they're perfectly happy. I think that there are a lot of individual differences there. I mean, I happen to be rather extreme as you know, obviously Baron Boyne was as well. And we have well, eyelids. If, we have eyelids, but we don't have ear lids. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. We can't. But if you're, cho I think when you begin to choose it and it, you know, if there's a program where you begin to choose it and you have the control, then it's okay. It's like when your neighbor's playing music and it could be music you might want to listen to, but when your neighbor's playing it, it becomes noise, right? Because you yeah. don't choose to listen to right. it. Right. I, I mean, I, think I, will, that's a, I will listen to music that I choose to listen to yeah. and in particular that's why maybe this kind of music that, that where you get a choice but it's the music where you don't get a choice that's for totally not even music it's just behavior control but i think turning it off the question is then you know do we begin to listen and how can how can we do how can we make sound design or is there a sound design for public spaces because of course in nature nature is a complete you know entity with sound and mm -hmm visuals and smell and things and we live in artificial cities and in artificial spaces and they're occupied by sound but they're not occupied by any sound that anybody gave any thought to right. it's just garbage really right. it's a it's the Hector maybe you can there were a lot a lot of people that weren't here before maybe you could kind of subtly put that back on but um, uh, so for me it was a, it was a question of well if I don't like music and I do like listening What's the alternative? And that's why I started doing installation. And I think, you know, you said, where's the, where is the hope? Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is why I like doing installations still. I've done this installation a lot. And so it's just because I think it, the hope is in communicating this idea of listening, you know, and people like Jeff Lee doing things in the SPAT lab and, and explaining how space, sound space works and uh, Shakov as well uh, to begin thinking about sound and space and spaces we live in and all kinds of things like that. Hmm. I think maybe that's also a good moment to open up for possible questions. Um, Did you turn that on, free. Hector? Okay, well, so. <laughs> yes, there's one. Do we have a microphone? A yes, okay. Well, just to, to, because there were some people that weren't here at the beginning, and uh, you weren't here as well. This was the sound that was playing in, when people came into the space. And of course now, because Hector turned it on, you heard it go on, but uh, no one noticed it when we came in. And then when it was turned off, of course, you realized that it was... Yeah. Right <laughs> Please, thank you. Thank you. Very fascinating. Uh, Hari Garudadri from Qualcomm Institute. Uh, we are actually working with uh, uh, devices for compensating for hearing loss. And, and given the status of the technology, these are not just for compensating for speech, just for speech intelligibility. You can have a lot more com complex devices. So the question for, for both of you is, from a spatialization perspective or when they're not listening, when, when they're not doing speech, tasks from a music listening perspective for people with hearing impairments. Is there something that I need to take away from what you guys have done and go read up your work before? Uh, what are your thoughts for people with hearing loss? No. I need to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Sharok, you want to answer? <laughs> 
think of it. It 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 is a it is quite a well okay maybe I I start answering in some ways and then um, my colleagues can follow up but um, my father has very very severe hearing loss and um, it um, and it matters to him so incredible that he 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 loses the a balanced frequency range. Uh, that that he could perceive, um, his hearing aid pushes kind of the mid range predominantly, um, so speech is possible for him to hear. But see, even if the hearing device would add or the frequency, he his ear it, it just those are lost. Um, so so um, so he in terms of music, he just there is no way that. He has been able to listen to music, so I was wondering if there are chances to make up for the frequency range. Uh, I I don't think we can make up for what is lost in the ear. Yeah. But definitely the the, the one big song that Robin presented that really got me thinking that there are regions in the hearing space that we know are not damaged. That's what the audiologist finds out, and based on some of the psycho physical experiments that you were describing, that you have done, is there something that we can do to the signals that come in, that we know they are not speech, it's music, we can do something to them, just like we compensate for different ranges of speech. Yes, because I, I talked about the, the using very narrow band signals to create very hi-fi spaces, right? And I really have to, th th maybe we can talk later, I really have to think about that. Of course, I've, you know, most of us have devoted a lot of thought to blindness and how, how well the ears perceive space and how we're guided in space, you know, without sight. And now you've turned the question around where I really have to th think about what happens when your hearing is uh, very reduced and how we can maybe address that situation. You know, one thing that we composers do when we create, um, mm. let's say, electroacoustic works, and we, uh, you mentioned it before, we have to make up a space. So we have to decide how, how deep the space is, how, how high, because there's no giving acoustic space when we create a, an artificial space where music takes place. and. And so we, you know, we, we gog very carefully uh, how we place the signal in, let's say, well, in a stereo field already, like how can we create depth to that space? So we, we you know, we have sounds that they are softer, but they have more uh, reverb, so they, they move, they're further away. So we, we deal with this closeness from sound further away sounds to, to give a sense of this, this richness and this tangibility uh, th that, that I mentioned before that is so vital in, in the installation. I'm yeah, at one point here. You know, when one thing is known that spatializations define the space for us, meaning that generally we get a feel for the space by our ears. So you walk in, how the place sounds will tell you the acoustics of the space. And the acoustics of the space are a, generally a one-dimensional signal that comes from the correlation between the two signals that come from the two ears. And uh, that's something that the brain does. Now, you, brought, you bring up a very interesting point, so I'm going to just think aloud a little bit about mm -hmm. the problem. Uh, there is this experiment that they have shown that seeing an image will bring a certain will, will start light up certain part of your brain but also imagining that image it lights up almost exactly the same part of the brain which is a little scary thought the fact that we could read people's mind you know by just doing putting an fmri you could actually see what kind of image they're thinking about in the same way, I think there is a corollary to that in auditory domain. So perhaps when you have hearing damage, if there is a, in the lower part of the ears, the point is for us to see 
what kind of signal the brain is picking up from the correlation between the two and perhaps provide some information there. One thing is that I think when you provide hearing devices, they don't necessarily produce the same equalization that the ear knows. Therefore, the, it's not possible to actually convey the spatialization. But if we would pay more attention, perhaps a little higher up, I don't know if it's possible or not, but I would imagine soon we, would, we could arrive by reading where the, the brain of the healthy, the people with healthy brain, how their brain functions when they hear something spatial and to be able to uh, send the signal to that location rather than the ear itself because I think there the process by which we become uh, aware of spatialization is very complex in the ear itself it's a lot of uh, circuitry so um, again I'm just thinking aloud here you bring up a very interesting point but that was a wonderful question for us. Thank you. <laughs> Give us a wake all night. Yeah. Someone else, please. Yes. Are uh, your installations physically static, but the content changes with the installation, especially for the permanent light? Or even um. That differs as well. Um, I've done some installations that change depending on weather and uh, so that they're always changing. And I don't have anything permanent like that simply because it's difficult to have that kind of um, maintenance that you need to, to have things installed. And so most of the things that are permanent, they're pre-recorded, they're done in the space, and then I arrive at some kind of um, uh, result and record it. Uh, I've done some installations that are semi-permanent that are, are um, uh, changing depending on uh, external elements, uh, but they're quite maintenance intensive mostly, or you're worried about them a lot, whether they're still working the next day or not. But I became very interested in, in this idea that um, I had some installations that that reacted to daylight, for example, this idea of architecture and that it changes depending on the daylight. And uh, so I use that. And then weather was even something that was even a longer term kind of thing. Uh, and I have had some uh, an installation that worked with weather sensors. And so some of the installations uh, did that. In the 90s, I did quite a few installations like that in which the content changes over time. These installations are all recorded. They're very easy to turn on and off. There's a button. You just turn the power on and it goes. <laughs> Which galleries like, right, Trish? <laughs> <laughs> Although, you know, it's there's still this analogy with nature, which I might mention again in that context, that you might go in sometimes and you'd be thinking about something else or talking to somebody and the next time you go in you would sit and listen and you'd hear something different than you heard the last time. So there's a lot of detail in it but it's at the same time very, it's, it seems flat but there's a lot of detail when you sit and listen, listen to it. Yeah, it, it, installations like that really invite you to spend some time and um, that's something that came up before in our conversation. I think to really take the time to listen and to be in a space and explore, explore the space and see how this, the, the sound changes and how the understanding changes. And that's how also you refer to like installations are experiments for perception, right? And hopefully every time you go in, you can discover something else. Anyone else? There was a question of whether the installation should be louder uh, for the opening because there's obviously more people here now than than uh, during the, the 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 day when it'll be on uh, for the next couple of months. And that was a question I dealt with a lot when I started doing installations. You know, when when if there was an opening or there was a lot of people around, it, to turn it up a bit and make it a bit louder, and then 
you really get into a competition with, you know, then there's people start talking louder because it's louder and then it gets away from you. And I'm the culprit, I ask. Can we have it louder? <laughs> <laughs> and my attitude now is if it's if it's there's too much noise and you don't hear it, then you don't hear it. It's like in nature, you know, you just it disappears and when it's quiet it resurfaces again. And I think that's the way we leave it for today. So in that context I would say if if you're in the uh, reception area, you can talk and things, but if you're in the installation, maybe you can not talk too much or not make too much noise for people that want to listen. And otherwise, come back when it's quiet. Yes. Um, thank you for the good questions and for being here.